Good morning, everyone. The September 2020 meeting of the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement is now in session. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. As you may know, on March 16th of this year, Governor Abbott temporarily suspended certain open meeting requirements in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. This permits meetings subject to the Open Meetings Act to be hosted by telephone or video conference. So today's meeting is being conducted in accordance with those guidelines. We've worked hard to keep the meeting in a format similar to what you're used to, our traditional in-person meetings. But for safety reasons today, we will not be able to have an honor guard present the colors. However, we felt that it was important that we honor our state and our country and give thanks. You will see the American flag on your screen. And I would ask that you join us as Commissioner Ron Hood leads us in the pledges. Commissioner Hood. And Commissioner Hood, uh, you may be on mute. We're not hearing you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. And Commissioner Hester, uh, would you please provide the invocation for us today? Yes, ma'am, if you would, uh, bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, thank you for this day and for each blessing, Lord. We thank you for the rain that you've given us over our land. Lord, today we ask that you be with us and guide us as we make decisions. Lord, we pray, pray for healing for our country, uh, for our citizens, Lord. Uh, we, we pray for those that are out there holding the line and protecting the general public. We ask that you be with them and guide them and bring them home safely. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much to you both. Uh, Ms. Jackson, will you please take the roll call? And commissioners, we will verbally respond um, to you if we're present. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Kim Lamo. Here. Commissioner Jason Hester. Here. Commissioner Patricia Burris. Present. Commissioner Ron Hood. Here. Commissioner Jack Taylor. Here. Commissioner Sharon Thomas. Commissioner Tim Whitaker. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Jana Atkins. Here. Commissioner Michael Griffiths. Here. We have a quorum. You know, as we uh, sat in the March commission meeting, I don't know that any of us could have ever have imagined that we would be in the middle of a global pandemic a very short time later, resulting in us holding our first virtual commission meeting. Um, Director Vickers, I want to thank you and your team uh, for all the preparations and all the efforts uh, that you've taken to prepare us for this meeting. And I want to give special thanks to Director Mike Antu and his team, uh, Jessica Capurro and Dennis Graffius. Uh, well done and thank you. So, you know, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all of the first responders to include our telecommunicators and uh, our, our jailers, um, all of the agents, em, agency employees that it takes to, uh, to provide the service that we do. Uh, you have continued to report for duty each day during the pandemic, and you continue to protect and serve our communities throughout. Uh, you are each to be commended, and uh, you are heroes for doing so. Uh, also like to thank the T-Call staff for your continual service in each of your respective roles. 
Director Vickers, I commend you and your staff on your flexibility and adaptability during these times, as the world has certainly changed and we are definitely not in the same place that we were six months ago. I'd like to also thank uh, my fellow commissioners and all of you joining us here today for your flexibility and patience as we work through our first virtual meeting. So we will go to uh, Director Grigsby and would you please read the names of the officers and jailers who have died since our March 2020 meeting, please. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, sadly, as we all know, uh, the last six months has been very difficult in a number of ways. Um, that includes for our law enforcement personnel uh, who have suffered 11 line of duty deaths as well as 30 COVID deaths across the state. Uh, I'll begin with the line of duty deaths. And first is Senior Deputy Christopher Corselius, Travis County Sheriff's Office, end of watch March 18th, 2020. Deputy Corselius was killed in a vehicle crash when his vehicle was struck by an oncoming car that had veered into his lane of travel. His vehicle overturned, trapping him inside and he succumbed to his injuries at the scene. Deputy Corzelius had served with the Travis County Sheriff's Office for four years and was assigned to the vice unit. Next is Corrections Officer Amanda De Leon, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, end of watch March 20th, 2020. Uh, Corrections Officer De Leon was killed in a vehicle crash while traveling from the Lopez State Jail to the Connolly unit for an assignment. Her vehicle left the roadway during a period of rain and overturned. She had served with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for six years and is survived by her parents and brother. Sheriff Kirk A. Coker, Hutchinson County Sheriff's Office, end of watch, March 29th, 2020. Sheriff Coker suffered a fatal heart attack shortly after responding to an unattended death near Fritch, Texas. He had cleared the death investigation and was en route to another call when he suffered a heart attack. His vehicle left the roadway and he was later found by deputies. Sheriff Coker had served with the Hutchinson County Sheriff's Office for 12 and a half years and had served in law enforcement for 35 years. He is survived by his wife and three children. Police Officer Justin Putnam, San Marcos Police Department, end of watch, April 18th, 2020. Officer Putnam was shot and killed when he and other officers responded to a domestic assault incident at an apartment complex. As the officers entered the apartment, they were ambushed by a subject with a rifle. Officer Putnam was killed and two other officers were wounded but survived. Officer Putnam had served with the San Marcos Police Department for five and a half years. He is survived by his fiance, sister, and other family members. Deputy Sheriff John Roden, Bell County Sheriff's Office, end of watch April 26, 2020. Deputy Roden was struck and killed by a vehicle while attempting to deploy spike strips during a vehicle pursuit of a stolen car. The pursuit had started in Williamson County and proceeded into Bell County. Deputy Roden was prepared to deploy the spike strips when he was struck by a tractor trailer. Deputy Roden had served with the Bell County Sheriff's Office for 10 years. Police Officer Jason Knox, Houston Police Department, end of watch May 2nd, 2020. Officer Knox was killed in a helicopter crash. He was aboard the helicopter as the tactical flight officer. The helicopter had been requested to search an area after police had received unconfirmed reports that two bodies were in the area. The helicopter experienced an issue during the search and crashed. Officer Knox suffered fatal injuries in the crash and the pilot also suffered severe injuries. Officer Knox had served with the Houston Police Department for eight years and he is survived by his wife, two children, and his parents. Sergeant Leonel Q. Martinez, Alamo College's Police Department, end of watch, May 5th, 2020. Sergeant Leonel Martinez suffered a fatal heart attack while responding to a shooting call. His patrol car then struck a parked car. Officers responding immediately started CPR and he was transported to a local hospital where he died a short time later. Sergeant Martinez had served with the Alamo College's District Police Department for 21 years. Deputy Constable Caleb Rule, Fort Bend County Constable's Office, Precinct 4, end of watch, May 29th, 2020. Deputy Constable Rule was inadvertently shot and killed by friendly fire while responding to a suspicious person call. A citizen had reported seeing a man running from a home in the area. 
and Deputy Rule had responded to the scene along with she, three sheriff's deputies and located a home with an open door. They were in the process of clearing the home when he was mistaken for a suspect inside of the home. Deputy Constable Rule was struck in the chest in an area not protected by his vest. He was transported to a local hospital where he succumbed to his wounds. Deputy Constable Rule had served with the Fort Bend County Constable's Office Precinct 4 for nine months and had previously served with the Missouri City Police Department for 14 years. He is survived by his wife and four children. Police officers Edelmiro, Edelmiro Garza Jr. and Ismael Chavez, McAllen Police Department. End of watch July 11, 2020. Officers Chavez and Garza were shot and killed from an ambush while responding to a domestic disturbance call at a home. They had approached the front door of the home when they were suddenly ambushed and shot before drawing their weapons or making an emergency broadcast. Other officers who were sent to check on them came across the scene and immediately requested backup. The subject who ambushed them committed suicide as additional units arrived on scene. Officer Chavez had served with the McAllen Police Department for two and a half years and Officer Garza had served with the McAllen Police Department for nine years. Police Officer Sheena Yarbrough Powell, Beaumont Police Department, August 9th, 2020. Officer Powell was killed when her patrol car was struck head on by a wrong way driver. Her partner was seriously injured in the crash and the 18 year old driver of the other vehicle was also injured and was later charged with manslaughter and intoxication assault. Officer Yarbrough Powell had served with the Beaumont Police Department for two years and is survived by her husband. And next I will read the names and end of watch dates of the uh, law enforcement personnel who have passed away from COVID-19. Beginning with Corrections Officer Kelvin Wilcher, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, April 6, 2020. Corrections Officer Jonathan Goodman, TDCJ, April 21st, 2020. Chaplain Akbar Shabazz, TDCJ, April 23rd, 2020. Corrections Officer Coy Kaufman Jr., TDCJ, April 26th, 2020. Corrections Officer James Coleman, TDCJ, April 28th, 2020. Detention Deputy Timothy De La Fuente, Bear County Sheriff's Office, April 30th, 2020. Sergeant Raymond Sholwinski, Harris County Sheriff's Office, May 6th, 2020. Corrections Officer Jesse Bolton, TDCJ, May 8th, 2020. Corrections <coughs> Officer Maria Men Mendez, TDCJ, May 9th, 2020. Chief of Police Marvin Trejo, Dumas Police Department, May 10th, 2020. Corrections Officer Thomas Ogunbire, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, June 11th, 2020. Sergeant Dale Malter, Travis County Constable's Office, Precinct 5, June 27th, 2020. Parole Officer Joseph Lang, TDCJ, July 1st, 2020. Corrections Officer Kenneth Harvin, TDCJ, July 4th, 2020. Lieutenant Bali Almager, Corpus Christi International Airport, Department of Public Safety, July 10th, 2020. Director Kyle Coleman, Bear County Fire Marshal's Office, July 14th, 2020. Corrections Officer Jerry Esparza, TDCJ, July 15th, 2020. Corrections Officer Jackson Pongai, TDCJ, July 19th, 2020. Border Patrol Agent Austin Aguilar, United States Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, July 25th, 2020. Investigator Mark Brown, Harris County Constable's Office, Precinct 5, July 25th, 2020. Corrections Officer Ruben Martinez, TDCJ, July 26th, 2020. Corrections Officer Eric Johnson, TDCJ, July 27th, 2020. Border, Pro Border Patrol Agent Marco Gonzalez, United States Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, August 5th, 2020. Corrections Officer Lebo F. Boa, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, August 12th, 2020. Corrections Officer Elizabeth Jones, TDCJ, August 15th, 2020. Corrections Officer Herbert Garcia, TDCJ, August 18th, 2020. Officer Lucas Saucedo, United States Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, Office of Field Operations, 
August 21st, 2020. Sergeant Raul Salazar Jr., Nueces County Sheriff's Office, August 23rd, 2020. Police Officer Jorge Cabrera, Mission Police Department, August 24th, 2020. And finally, Corrections Officer James Weston Jr., TDCJ, August 26th, 2020. We'll now take a moment of silence to honor these brave men and women and also pray for their families. Okay. Moving on to the next agenda item uh, is the approval of the minutes from our March 5th, 2020 quarterly commission meeting there in Austin. Uh, do we have a motion? Oh, let me go back. I'm sorry. Um, for the commissioners, we will vote by a show of hands. So if you'll please keep your hands raised until Ms. Jackson responds that she has received a vote. Now you may want to check and make sure that your hand is visible on screen. Um, sometimes the, the screen is a, a little more uh, restrictive than when we're there in person. And Ms. Jackson, if you'll please signal by uh, received or, or thank you for the vote, that would uh, assist us. Also, if you have a question and comment, uh, we'll again raise your hand and uh, we'll all have to remember to uh, mute and unmute. So we will uh, work on that. So uh, do we have a motion uh, for the approval of the minutes? Um. I'll make a motion to approve the March 2020 minutes. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. My camera is supposed to be off, but I'm raising my hand. And who was that? Griffiths. Griffiths, got it. And Commissioner Hood. Yep, got it. All right, I got it. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Griffiths, is, is uh, will your camera not be on? My computer's saying it has difficulties and it will not uh, activate. Okay, understood. So we will, uh, the rest of the commissioners, we will uh, do a vote by a show of hands. And then, um, Ms. Jackson, we will, at the end, when you have everyone's hand count, then we will go to Commissioner Griffiths and get his vote. Right, thank you. Okay. So. Uh, anyone opposed to the approval of the minutes? Same sign. So we have an approval of the minutes of the meeting. So we're now going to move to agenda item four, which is receiving the T. Cole reports. Uh, Director Vickers, would you please start us off, sir? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good to be here with you. I'm, I'm Kind of odd to say I'm getting used to these virtual meetings. I've had so many of them, so uh, it doesn't seem very unusual to me. Um, you will find in your packet the normal document, your uh, budget status through June of 2020, and also the criminal misconduct quarterly report will be in there for you. Um, I, I will have a rather short report for you this morning. There's, there, I'm trying to keep it rather short since we're on this different format until we get used to it. Um, I wanted to touch on the Sunset Committee, as you know, we are uh, in the process of undergoing sunset review, uh, which is a very, very thorough review of our processes and all the, the different things that we do. A um, Couple of comments I wanted to make on it. Number one, I've been very, very pleased with uh, the sunset staff has been exceedingly um, courteous and friendly. And, and we, uh, our meetings have been very, uh, I won't say informal because they're not informal, but but we they make you feel pretty comfortable on them, and, and, and they've done a really good job. 
it's way too early uh, to, to tell you what I think we're going to see out of it. Um, it is kind of sometimes it appears that it could be obvious some directions they are heading uh, and, and the feasibility is there that there could be some pretty dramatic changes for us coming down the down the road but we're a long way from that being anything settled so I don't want to go into anything detailed there because I'm not sure exactly what direction that will end up but there's some pretty dramatic changes being discussed so uh, might be interesting to see what the final report says when it comes out. Um, I want to commend uh, my staff and thank you uh, Madam, Madam Chairman for uh, noticing that and mentioning them. I want to say the same thing. Uh, as you said, nobody would have expected this would happen and, and our staff um, jumped into a whole new way of doing business in about a two-day period. And, and we moved them all out of here, nearly everybody out and the home. Uh, they have adjusted very well. Work production has not decreased at all. And uh, they have done an exceedingly good job of adapting to this new role and handling it well. And I'm very proud of the job that they do. So I wanted to take an opportunity to, to echo what you said about the staff and, and the amazing job that they've done. Uh, finally, the last thing that I was going to just quickly mention to you, we're very, you already know about this, but just make it kind of uh, um, said out loud here that we're upset about having to cancel our TCOL conference, but we feel strongly it was the right thing to do for uh, for safety's sake and for our, our stakeholders' sake and for our staff's sake, that uh, uh, it was best that we just not do that this year. Um, we, we were able to come to a good agreement with the Omni in Corpus so that there was, there was no real penalty involved with a, with a cancellation and uh, uh, that went fairly uh, smoothly and we're just sad to see it go. But we're joined with uh, nearly every one of the conferences that I end up attending sometime during the year. All of them have been canceled. So I think this is not unexpected around the state and people uh, understand it pretty well. That's all I have at this time, unless you have questions for me. Uh, that's all I have from my report this morning. Oh, oh, I almost forgot one thing. Um, Mary Kay Wright, our most tenured employee uh, with a commission, uh, retired August 31st. She had over 38 years of service with this agency. Uh, her expertise that she has gained in knowledge in, in the commission and the processes um, far beyond what just she, her specific role was, uh, will be missed. And, and uh, I am, I, I was really sad to see her go, but we wish her well in her retirement and uh, hope that she does very well. I will mention that brings us with that, with the hiring freeze we have going right now, credentialing is down to uh, what they're down one third of their strength. And uh, we have a meeting with the governor's office coming up, and I'm going to make a point to try to see if they'll allow us to at least hire one of those positions back so we can shore that staff up a little bit and not have them working too short. But uh, congratulations to uh, Mary Kay, and, and we appreciate her service. And that will be the end of the report, unless there are any questions. No, absolutely. Um, commissioners, any questions for the executive director? Uh, Commissioner Burris. Um, thanks for the update, Kim. I wanted to kind of get um, actually Brian's overall uh, take on since we're kind of we're closing out a year here and starting another year with everything that's going on. I'd like to hear from Brian about um, our financial position. You know, we've saved a lot in terms of travel and you know some of these kinds of things while uh, we still have licensing dues but the um, conference is usually um, brings in some additional funds and anyhow Brian I'll let you explain to us kind of what what our position is this year and, and what you kind of see going forward thank you commissioner uh, as you know is our finances were hit uh, with revenue wise with uh, the coronavirus, uh, they started declining in April. Uh, so we've had less revenues than we expected throughout the, the last six months of the year. 
uh, we will not be having a conference like uh, Kim mentioned, so we will not be collecting that revenue. Uh, all state agencies are under a 5% cut. For us, that's about 339,000 for the biennium. For the fiscal year that just ended a couple days ago, uh, we'll be able, through the savings you're talking about, uh, less travel, hiring freeze, uh, we'll be able to satisfy a little more than half of that at about 175,000 this year. So next fiscal year, the current fiscal year, uh, we'll have a little bit less than half to pay off on that, that 5%. Um, looking forward to, to the next fiscal year, as Kim mentioned, we're in, in the sunset process. We're also in a strategic fiscal review process by the LBB, and we're in the LAR process. And of course, uh, we'll, we're gonna work with you all and uh, hopefully go hand in hand to the Capitol with, with some great ideas and, and maybe uh, a little better chance this session of getting some of those things that, that we need to provide to our customers. Um, yes, sir. Chair, if I can kind of tie in on, in on the end of that, I will say, uh, and I, I meant to mention during the sunset review, uh, you know, it, it happens every once every 12 years, and it's, it's, a, it's a very um, involved process through which you, you have to, to, to work, and um, it has gone very well. But I want to say that I think the timing of it may have been a bit fortuitous for us because given the current climate around the country and the way everything is going as far as, as uh, looking at police reform, looking at uh, issues with, with problem officers and, and dealing with that, which is part of our role inherently, um, I think that our relevance in all in, in this whole scheme of things has become very, very apparent. And, and uh, I am very optimistic going into this next session um, and through sunset that the good work and the important things that this agency does are going to be noticed. And that's where I think you'll see some of the changes. So um, uh, yes, the, the cut hurt. You know, we, the, we saved a lot of money on travel and stuff and it turned right around and we pretty much gave it all back with with uh, the the five percent cut that we're having to come up with but because of the savings being offsetting that we're in pretty good shape and uh, i'm looking for good things in the upcoming session I'm, I'm coming into it very optimistic i know that may scare gretchen a little bit but i'm coming into it very optimistic and i'm i'm looking for good things i just wanted to, to say that well thank you for the update any other questions Commissioner Burris. So you mentioned the um, the quarterly reports. They're in our packet. We get them quarterly, hence the name quarterly reports, um, in, including um, including offenses committed by officers. Now we've been getting those for for a long time now. We had a reason uh, way back when. I think this is one of the things that Commissioner Hester had brought up some time back um, and we had questions on. We've been receiving them now for several years. Um, I know it takes a lot of time to, to get that done. Um, I just wanted to, to bring up to the commission, from my perspective, I think I've had enough time to look at these um, uh, at each meeting and kind of get a general sense of, of where the majority of those offenses lie, um, where those problem uh, areas are. And for, for me, um, I would be okay with not receiving these anymore in the packet, but um, you know, knowing that one day we may ask you again you know, to, to have them or, um, or, or something, something else similar. But I just wanted to put that out there. I've been meaning to, and I've kind of forgotten a few times, but I'm bringing it up today.
Any other thoughts from uh, other commissioners? Commissioner Hester? Yeah, so going back on that, uh, that, that Commissioner Burris is, is talking about, when we used to get that report, it was a very uh, a general report with, with the high level numbers. And, and so I'd ask for those numbers to be broken down a little bit. Um, it, it, to her point, it may be something if you guys are spending a, a, a tremendous amount of time on uh, that, that may not be needed. I don't know what the, uh, what the other commissioners uh, thoughts are on the report um on needing it but it's always something that we could probably get uh should we want it uh for, for anything else that goes on uh with that so um i my other question or comment that i had uh and it's probably both forward director vickers and and, and brian as we go through here uh through the rest of this covid and we have to continue with the reduction into the next physical year how long do how long are we going to have to keep travel at bay? How long are we going to have to keep vacancies open to come up with the other part of the five percent? And then moving forward, um, you know, we're we're on a regular schedule for inspections and audits. Uh, what what is the plan moving forward that we need that executive staff are looking at in order to fulfill the mission that we have to do, and 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 how we're going to do that into this next fiscal year? with that so that, that those are the two questions i have thank you commissioner hester um i'm not sure when uh the governor's office will lift some of those restrictions they have partially lifted them for us um now in the new agency creation uh was addressed and the governor's office said that they would consider that to be essential travel and they they said it would be fine for us to do that um i like i said we're having a meeting with the governor's office next week and and i was going to address the exact things that you're taught among other things um uh, i was going to address with them the idea of when can we may, maybe pick up a position here or there to, to shore up weekend areas and and also um maybe try to pin down a little bit the definition of essential travel where we can we can start sending those field agents out. The field agents are are doing tabletop audits uh, as best they can. Um, it's uh, interesting you say that. One of the things that's being looked at uh, that we've looked at, and Sunset's even mentioning, is the potential of uh, um, housing documents from around the state, officers' documents, in some sort of very secure cloud environment where we could get to those documents prior to going out, which would expedite our job quite a bit. So I, I'm, I'm hesitant to make too many broad sweeping changes on, on how we're going to do this until I see exactly what comes out of this new system that everyone is looking at. Um, but, but our guys are, are keeping busy. They're still helping agencies. They're still uh, working on audits as they can. Um, I'm going to try to address and see if I can get travel loosened up a little bit this next week. Uh, where we can we can start at least resuming some of those audits because uh, we do have totals that we're supposed to hit under our performance measures. Uh, I know that that uh, that LBB and the and and the legislature will be understanding on that that COVID has affected all of that. But we're going to make sure our job gets done. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't I can't give a definite plan at this point because um, we're still kind of processing all that. But we're we're going to make a move to try to get more get out into the state more here pretty quickly i've i've got to talk to them about i'm still being invited to speak and do our a tcol part of a the class at the different chiefs classes around the state and i'm not sure how that's going to be looked at there are several travel issues that need to be looked at on how that's going to come about and um if you don't mind me once again tying on to that i want to say a thank you a big thank you to Steve McCraw and, and the Department of Public Safety um, and to Commissioner Hester uh, um, and also to Gretchen's husband who is now retired from DPS but was was a, a fairly high-ranking uh, person DPS. We had an issue in the office where we had a positive test for COVID 
and and we took appropriate precautions to try to make sure everybody was safe. One of those was getting people tested. This all happened real quickly. DPS jumped up and offered uh, to let our people come over and use their testing process for free. Uh, they took care of all of our testing processes, get the, getting the results, and they cleared us through that that time. And uh, I want to publicly say a thank you to the Department of Public Safety, to, to Commissioner Hester, and to Steve McCraw and his and and uh, uh, Aaron Grigsby um, for their assistance. They're, they've they've been a great partner for us when things come up and we need their help. They've been very good to do that, and I wanted to take a moment to say that out loud as well. Did that answer your question? Okay, sir. Yeah, Kim, it did. I, I, I just, I, I think we just probably need some clarity. Uh, and so, you know, as a, well, that, as a, another state agency uh, to help in that, I, I think the, uh, the department is, is good in, in partnership with that. And so I appreciate the kind words and, and, and I know the Colonel probably does as well. Um, going back to the, uh, the comment with the, uh, the governor's office and, and, uh, the, the travel. Um, I think we probably need, need some clarity and guidance on 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 having that with them because I do think the public expects that T. Cole is still out doing uh, the audits and, and things that they need to be doing. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we'll get to a resolution with that and get to some sense of normalcy and and all the mitigating circumstances you got to do with COVID and everything else that goes along with that. Has, has caused a lot of uh, uh, of issues. So uh, hopefully, uh, uh, moving forward, we can get back to a little bit more normal uh, in, in how we do our inspections and stuff. So thank you very much, and thank you to staff for all the work that they've been doing. Okay, um, I don't see any additional. Oh, Commissioner Burris. Um, yeah, I just wanted. Again, I know it's kind of weird having conversation this way, but it is what it is. Um, you know, there there's definitely technology out there for us to use in terms of this secure, um, receiving secure dockets and, and, and doing that. I know that's not cheap. So we're definitely going to need, like you said, some clarity and some guidance um, from the governor's office. And hopefully there's something you would imagine there's there are things already set up that we can maybe, um, you know, set up additional users, um, which would be our staff to be able to do that. But, um, you know, if, if we're getting, if the ex expectation is going to be on us to pay uh, solely for something like that, um, I don't know that that's something that we would have a budget for. So um, I'm, I'm sure the governor's office uh, in conversations with you, you guys will be able to figure something out and um, we look forward to hearing from you uh, the information that you get and how we're going to go forward on doing those things. And in addition to that, Sunset, um, like you said, Mr. Vickers, while you're optimistic and um, I didn't quite see Gretchen's face when you said that because I was making my own. You never know until the report comes out. Um, having been through the process uh, before in a separate um, area, it's, you know, there are certain things that you think surely they're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this and then they receive almost like, you know, just a byline, um, a footnote. And then there's other things that you didn't really realize they were gonna uh, focus on where they've kind of gone out and done their own research and um, apart from the conversations we've had. And so we'll just see when it comes. Um, my uh, conversation with the um, committee was like an hour and five minutes. They were uh, very on point. As you stated, there are certain things that, that are expected. Um, and then there was a couple things that weren't, but we'll see how how that goes. And hopefully, I didn't negatively uh, impact <laughs> their opinion as a commission during that. But um, and I, I just wanted to come back to 
I, I, I put that thought out there on, on the reports that Commissioner Hester and I were talking about. Um, if we want to make a change or not, like it would be good to kind of get the temperature of the commission on that um, today or if not at the, the next meeting. Thank you. I was going to go back to that. Um, any other thoughts uh, on those reports from the other commissioners? I'm going, uh, Commissioner Hood. I, I would just like to throw in my two cents regarding the uh, misconduct report. Uh, I do find it informative. I do find it uh, uh, enlightening as to what's going on with the, uh, the enforcement and the, the corrections of these officers. Maybe quarterly is uh, asking too much. Maybe it is, uh, but I wouldn't. I would like to continue to receive them if nothing more than an annual report uh, in this format, just to keep us informed. But I do find the reports informative. Thank you for your feed. Thank you for your feedback. Um, anyone else? Kim, can you uh, work with the staff and come back to us in December, um, maybe with some thoughts and ideas? Um, you know, we want to be respectful of the amount of time it takes to uh, to put that information together. Um, uh, I also find some value in in, in looking at that, um, given what is happening nationally. Um, it's probably an area that we may want to uh, keep abreast of or at least have uh, some knowledge of. So if, uh, if you and your team can get together and maybe provide us in December with some options that would uh, potentially reduce your workload but still provide us with the information, that would be great. Yes, ma'am, be happy to. Okay. Okay, we will not be having, um, not be hearing from uh, Director Antu this morning. Um, Director Grissom, uh, let us all take the opportunity to congratulate you on your new position. Uh, we were excited uh, to hear about the promotion for you and uh, know that you will uh, do great things. Uh, you have some big shoes to fill, but I think uh, I think we all know that. But I know that you'll do a great job, and uh, we appreciate all the great work that you've been doing. And I understand it's been somewhat of a seamless transition. Uh, so uh, thank you so very much. If you'd like to give us your report, we'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Chief. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, appreciate the support. Uh, credentialing continues to rock on uh, with the employees rotating through uh, office assignments to reduce exposure. However, we still touch a bunch of uh, documents via paper. We still process a lot of uh, payments, so the staff is rotating through their positions. Uh, so that that continues to get done. Um, I think we're, it, it, as uh, Director Vicker said, we're down two employees in that section. Uh, so there's some cross training going on. Uh, we're, we're taking an opportunity to uh, train up multiple employees in those processes that Mary Kay took uh, ownership of. Uh, she will certainly be missed. It was nice to be able to walk out of the office and and have the longest tenured uh, T. Cole employee sitting outside my door when I needed the historical perspective or needed, uh, especially in the sunset process. She remembers, that, you know, sunset goes back into arcane things that that happened in the past and, and Mary Kay could put names with jobs and everything else with it that was uh, quite a resource uh, as Kim said the the field service agents are doing the best they can to support their clients at home 
the bulk of what they're doing is, is what they always do is the customer service. Um, the, the travel restrictions have made, uh, of course, you know, you know, put a hold on audits. Uh, they're still trying to focus on reaching out specifically to new chief administrators who are taking over the position. Uh, normally, they would do that with a boots on the ground visit um, to, to get that new chief administrator up and running in compliance, make sure they're not inheriting a problem from, from uh, the, the previous person who was there. So a lot of that still happening remotely. Um, they also have cabin fever. They're chomping at the bit to get out and, and see their customers. Uh, and, and they realize that the importance of, of doing that. So as, as the boss said, we'll be, uh, asking the governor's office for a little more freedom, uh, to do that. That's really all I have this morning, unless you have any questions. Uh, the, the one other thing I guess would point out, one of the things that's very common right now due to COVID uh, is uh, we're issuing uh, temporary waivers for agencies who are in the recruiting process to use remote uh, psychological examination uh, processes. Uh, they have to request that. Uh, they have to ensure that it's HIPAA compliant and secure. And but we are issuing a lot of waivers to agencies who are uh, going through the L3 psychological exam process. Well, no, we all certainly appreciate uh, your initiative and adaptability. I think. Uh, We've all had to, to make many, many adjustments uh, as we uh, journey through COVID. Um, I think it's important um, that the field, ag field agents do get back out. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the efforts, Kim, that you're making or will be making next week to, uh, to ask for some uh, flexibility in the, in the travel. I mean, we're, we're uh, assisting um, and, you know, trying to manage and help agencies who, um, who've never left the field. I mean, they've, they've, you know, while there may be some administrators or professional staff that have been able to re work remotely, uh, the majority of the agencies that we're serving have been on the front line since day one. Um, they've never left. So they, uh, they need our services. And uh, I think it's important that we're out there providing it to the to the level that they need. Uh, for my fellow commissioners, any questions, comments um, for Mr. Grissom? Okay, I don't see any there. So, Director Grigsby, we will go to you and welcome your report. Hello, once again, commissioners. Uh, I will start by saying, uh, Commissioner Burris, you were talking about the IT resources that we're looking for. Um, we've been having many conversations with the Sunset staff, uh, with the Legislative Budget Board, uh, who we will actually be speaking with tomorrow, including their quality assurance team members as it relates to information resources projects. Uh, we've also been in conversations with the Department of Information Resources and have actually been making some good headway there uh, and we'll be submitting uh, a new feature that they have called an idea ticket that is intended to support smaller agencies in particular like ourselves uh, where we don't have to go through the traditional consulting process and the expenses that go along with that when we're looking at new systems. Um, so all of that will ultimately uh, moving on, turn into part of our exceptional item request. Uh, our legislative appropriation request is due next Friday. Uh, and so we are working on that, including, you know, the myriad of things that we will be asking for. Um, I, like Chief Vickers, am cautiously optimistic, though we are in a very difficult uh, budget cycle. Um, our importance um, with the sunset process and with national conversations on police reform uh, has been strongly highlighted. And so if there were ever a time 
that we would be asking for um, what T. coal needs to look like in our estimation, now is that time. And so our, our budget request will certainly reflect that. Uh, again, as we've been talking about the sunset process, uh, we had our kickoff meeting on June 11th. Uh, and we've continued to have multiple conversations with them and with uh, they've been also talking with stakeholders. Uh, we've been providing uh, quite a few uh, data requests for them. The next step will be that staff report that they will put out and our opportunity to respond to it. Uh, after that, there will be a public hearing with the Sunset Commission, uh, the, including the 10 legislators that comprise that commission and the two public members. We don't know, uh, that's a little bit in flux right now uh, because of some discussions about ways that they can do that either in person or online. And so it was tentatively scheduled for November and we will see uh, what the ultimate schedule ends up like uh, on that. But as of right now, we're gonna wait for the staff report to come out and play it by ear from there. Uh, of course, we're also in the midst of our normal session preparations and what our, uh, legislation requests will look like and that has kept us plenty busy around here so i'm happy to answer any questions that you have i appreciate all of y'all's uh, attention to the sunset process and to everything that we've been working on uh, it certainly has been appreciated by staff and i know the sunset staff has appreciated it as well commissioners any thoughts or questions Uh, Commissioner Burris. Uh, I, I just, I would like to get um, some more kind of um, some information reports, kind of how things are going uh, along through this process. Since we're not meeting again until December, a lot is going to happen. I mean, probably like the most we've had done at any <laughs> point kind of um, in, in the next couple months here. And so I would really appreciate uh, a little bit more frequent updates on kind of how things are going, how they're progressing um, throughout the process and processes because they've kind of all come together at the same time for you guys. So, and as always, if there's anything that you need from, from me, uh, I'm more than happy to, to do my part and whatever that means, writing a letter, being on a call. Um, I don't know if we're going to meet in person with anyone ever, but <laughs> for a while now, but um, again, I'm, I'm letting you know my, my availability, but I, I would appreciate getting some more information as we go along through this. Absolutely, we're happy to do that, and we will definitely be in communication uh, as we go along. It, like I said, there's a lot in flux, and so we'll we'll keep you up to date. Part of the problem on that, Commissioner, is that we don't really know. <laughs> I mean, we can we can I'll be we'll we make sure that we get you information on kind of where we feel like we're standing on it, but exactly what you said earlier you really never know where that's going to go when it's all over. We feel like we know kind of some areas where they're focusing in and kind of where we are, but, but they told us from the very beginning, uh, this will not be a positive report. That's not their job. And they will not comment on the good things we're doing. They want to comment on things that need to be changed. And so we're expecting that, but, um, we're, we're in a little bit of a guess of, exactly how it's going ourselves, but I will make sure that you're well informed on where we are and the, and the, the type of things that we're doing so that you, you're you comfortable with that. Be happy to do that. Right, and it's more like just kept keeping up to breast on, these are the requests we made, like this is when the next, you know, meeting, when, when the commission, the, commit, the sunset committee actually meets, you know, when that's going to take place, kind of these more, um, you know, the, the markers as we're going along, as opposed to your guess, because yeah, we, we don't know until it comes out, but, but I'd like to know where we are in the process and kind of what we've asked for and 
and uh, things like that. Okay, Commissioner Hester. So I, I kind of wanted to have a conversation or uh, get Director Grigsby and, and Director Vickers both their um, comments and thoughts on the LAR, sorry, the legislative appropriations request. And, um, you know, at, at, at some point we probably need to look at, at what role does the commission play in that process, um, if any, uh, given the time frame that you have that sometimes uh, LBB puts things out such last minute in order to get things through. So I just kind of want to get the feedback on y'all uh, from y'all uh, on that entire LAR and what our what our role is as commissioners that you see from your perspective as as those approvals and the budget goes forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, absolutely. And then I'll defer to Gretchen when I finish my part of it, if she has anything to add. Um, the LAR is going to be very difficult this time. Um, we're being encouraged to be sure and and ask for what we need, uh, especially if uh, with the potential of an expanded role. The trouble is we don't know to what extent, if any, our role will be expanded and our scope of authority will be expanded. And so it's kind of hard to know what to ask for. Um, um, especially uh, in in a time as been mentioned before when the budget is in a, a tough budget time right now for the state but um, we're planning on this being a fairly significant uh, ask I think our our LAR is going to be uh, ha uh, can be comprised of some fairly significant requests for additional resources and I will tell you as far as the commissioner's role um, Last time we did this, the legislative committee met with us and, and, and we worked through some of that with them, um, which you were a very big part of. And I will tell you, your role ended in, uh, that ended up being pretty invaluable because we instituted some of the suggestions that you had and it, it ended up with some really good um, end results for us. So I, that will be totally, uh, Commission involvement in that um, uh, much will be determined by by the chief, um, my chief Lamo. Um, but I'm going to hope and 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 look forward to the legislative committee uh, hopefully taking time to work with us on that. It'll have to be pretty quickly, um, but we need some input. I would like I really welcome your input on that uh, as being part of that legislative committee because it helped the last time. So, uh, but I understand going into it, we're struggling. A little bit um, because it's a very unusual time and there are a lot of pieces in play that we don't know how they're going to land and that's having a big impact on exactly what direction do we take and to what extent uh, that direction goes with our LAR so um, I'll let I'll let Gretchen follow up on that if she has anything else to add but that's kind of where I feel like we stand uh, I, we welcome uh, the commissioners being a part in, in as much a part of that as as uh, they feel like they would like to be. Um, historically, commissioners have not come in and actually run that process or or approve that process. But I I welcome I welcome whatever input and approval you choose to do on that. I really do. I mean it it, it never hurts to have additional ideas and eyes in there which showed last time and so uh, however you want to take part sir we'd be happy to have you commissioner burrs oh i hadn't realized i unmuted myself but it's great timing <laughs> i think um we definitely need to ask for what we need i know Historically, we've been extremely conservative, um, you know, for a lot of a lot of reasons. Um, and I, I think I'm usually the one encouraging us to like go bigger, go bolder, and ask for more. Um, and I, I think definitely, if you go back to back to March and when we had a really great discussion um, between. All the commissioners and we really enjoyed that that process in our strategic planning meeting um, this is coming on the heels 
of that. So I think um, the the good takeaway from that is is you kind of know, not kind of, you should know um, what our priorities are. Right, we listed um, our priorities uh, for the for the next couple of years, and so. I know you'll be drawing from those conversations that we had um, in addition to what we actually listed as our priorities. Um, and then we're going to encourage you definitely to be, try to be creative. And, and you're gonna have to guess a little bit <laughs> where you think this might go. And it's just, you know, it's really going to be based on what you're hearing coming from Austin, what you're hearing coming from the national news. Um, as well, and kind of where um, where we might be able to do more, you know, one to me, one obvious one that's that's going to come up is mental health in the community and um, the interaction of that community with law enforcement. And so that's something that's in our um, strategic plan. It has been for a long time now. Uh, what we included in March that we hadn't included previously was also focusing on uh, the mental health of officers themselves and the importance of peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer group uh, interactions for them and, and things of that nature. So um, that's definitely something that's being discussed um, nationally as well as in the state. And so that's that's an example of where um, we might need to consider we're going to need more money um, and and focus to be able to get some of these things done. And now is the time to ask for it given the climate in this country. So uh, I really encourage you all to break a little bit outside of kind of what, what you're used to, um, as, as you stated. Um, Mr. Rickers, this is this is the time to do it. It's fortuitous, like you stated, that we're we're going through the sunset process right now while this is going on. Um, so let's let's reach. Yes, ma'am. I will promise you our our discussion so far are reaching um, significant reaching. The, the issue is, and, and we're going to be talking with LBB as well, um, if some of the ideas that have been floated around, uh, maybe through Sunset and other stuff comes into play, even our far-reaching ones may not meet some of the requirements that are there. So we may, I hope that we have the opportunity to even in the process go and uh, go back and amend some of our ask, some of the, the requests that we make if what's coming out of, of what appears to be maybe coming out in sunset nine legislation uh, would truly change our role in many instances in officer misconduct and and in some other areas so but but i promise you uh, and and i'll make sure you see those um you'll see that our ask is dramatic already and and uh, i feel exactly like you do given the national climate given the, the calls I'm getting from legislators around the state, asking for information and making comments to me, and and the, the, the current climate of this whole, the, uh, the whole law enforcement idea and law enforcement reform, um, we're, we're gonna, we're, we're moving forward with a, with a dramatic ask. It, it's, uh, the budget doesn't really reflect that we can do that, but we're gonna do it. And, and uh, I'd be glad to discuss that with you and show you uh, some of the preliminary stuff that we, we, we've uh, looked at. None of it's finalized yet, but we're we're working in that direction. But I certainly understand what you're saying. And let me just wrap, wrap up my part by saying, I know you guys are probably not getting a ton of sleep. It, you have a lot on your plates right now. And I definitely recognize that and thank you all for your work and I know I know, don't know that you're going to get much rest until next year. Um, just kind of the pace at which you need to keep keep things up and keep things going. So I do want to thank you for your work on it and know that 
what you do right now is really appreciated by us and it's going to make um, a huge impact on the, the state. So thank you guys for, for your work. I have a great staff, what can I say? <laughs> yes, you do. Um, any other thoughts and comments? Well, again, I know uh, it's a long time before we meet. Three months is a, uh, as Patricia said, three months is a long time. And uh, uh, let's look at maybe some options for enhancing the communication. And um, um, even if it means uh, having, you know, having a meeting, I know we have to to uh, abide by some rules there. So we can uh, we can discuss that uh, a little bit further and. Um, See if we can uh, make that happen between now and in December as as things unfold. So, and I have to agree with with both uh, both commissioners. Uh, I think this is the year to ask. Uh, this is the the time uh, to ask. Um, and I think we shoot. Uh, you know, we shoot for the moon on it. Uh, the worst that can happen is you know we get a no, uh, but we don't know if we don't ask. So. Um, I too am supportive of that. And as I'm looking at the screen, I have to say that um, you know, we had talked about raising hands if you have comments. And um, I just had a realization that uh, uh, Commissioner Griffiths uh, can't do that. So uh, I will ask you, Commissioner Griffiths, if you do have comments, we can see the screen, we can see um, whether someone is muted or not muted. So if you do have a comment, if you will unmute your mic, um, then I will know that you have a comment. And, and um, if somehow I miss you, then just uh, please interrupt. And, and uh, we wanna make sure that we don't miss anything that you might have to say. And I see your mic unmuted, so I didn't know if you have a comment, sir. Commissioner Griffiths, did you have a did you have a comment? Well, I will. Um, okay, and I noticed that you are now unmuted. So, um, if you did have a comment, or um, like I said, if you'll just unmute, that would be great. Um, are there any other? Thoughts, questions, comments from the commissioners before we move on to the next item. Okay, well, let's move on to agenda item five, which is discuss and take action on the request for waiver of TCO rule 217.1, minimum standards for enrollment and initial licensure. Um, this will involve, uh, the agenda item involves uh, the Colleen Fire Department, who has asked for a waiver for Bo Arnold. And it is my understanding we have two speakers signed up, uh, interim chief Cody Simmons and Bo Arnold. Um, so Mr. Simmons, uh, would you like to make comment or address the commission? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Good morning, commissioners. Uh, I am the interim fire chief here in Colleen Fire Department. We're requesting a waiver for uh, Captain Bo Arnold. At this time, I'm going to let him speak on his behalf, please. Uh, I'm Bo Arnold. I've been working for the Colleen Fire Department for 20 years. Uh, in the room also is uh, the fire marshal, James Chisholm. Uh, I recently uh, moved over to the fire marshal's office, and as part of uh, completing my fire investigator, I uh, have to attend the police academy. 26 years ago, I was uh, pulled over for speeding while I was moving. Uh, uh, the vehicle was uh, searched after I was pulled over for speeding, and they found a butterfly knife in my car, uh, which were illegal then. So I was charged with unlawful carrying a weapon, uh, and I did deferred adjudication for it. As I was told I was, it was not going to be on my record. Uh, but uh, uh, as, as you know, it, it stays. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, so I'm requesting a waiver so that I can uh, attend the uh, police academy and uh, stay in the fire marshal's office. I'll take any questions they have. Well, I'd like to thank the, the three of you for being here today and for joining us. I think it's uh, um, always very helpful and beneficial to us when uh, we have the opportunity to hear from you personally and, and have the opportunity for questions. So um, I will ask my fellow commissioners, um, are there any questions or comments of um, any of the three gentlemen? Okay, I'm not seeing that anyone um, has questions. So do we have a motion? Oh, um, Commissioner Whitaker. Uh, yeah, I'll, I can make the motion to uh, record for the waiver. Seconded. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Miss Jackson, you were muted. I'm assuming that you did. You receive the vote. I did, except for Commissioner Griffiths. Okay, Commissioner Griffiths. And Commissioner Griffiths, I would ask that maybe you check your volume because we are not hearing anything from you, sir. Mr. Beecham, I'm going to ask for your assistance and guidance here on the best way to proceed with receiving Mr. Griffith's vote. I think let's try one more time to see if we can uh, get him through the, I, I think what we can do, Madam Chair, is if, if it comes down to a tie vote, uh, then we could seek alternate routes to get that vote. In this case, we obviously have enough votes for the motion to pass. Uh, for whatever reason, we're having a technical difficulty or, or an inability to get in touch with the sheriff. Uh, perhaps uh, staff, one of staff, can attempt to get a hold of him, uh, which we can do in order to try to get us uh, on the right track technologically here. Okay. Um Kim, I'd ask that. I will try to call him real quick. Okay. Um, <clears throat> motion passes. Um, so congratulations, um, Mr. Arnold. Thank you very much. Chief Simmons. Um, Thank you very much. You're most welcome. And again, we uh, we appreciate uh, you joining us today. Um, Kim, we end up in these situations uh, such as this request for a waiver where it takes a period of time before we're, we come together to meet and are able to make and provide a decision, um, understanding that this impacts the person requesting the waiver, it impacts the agencies, the agency heads as they struggle with staffing and, and budget uh, decisions, but most importantly, it potentially impacts the citizens that uh, these agencies serve. So I would like to ask you and your staff if you would research some options for addressing these delays. And I recognize that these delays are currently unavoidable, but if you could bring these op options back to the commission in the December meeting for discussion and possible action, depending on what those options are, um, I would be, uh, appreciative of that and let me ask you uh is that a reasonable time frame for you and staff to 
to develop some options. Uh, if not, then we can uh, look at March, but I'd rather get it done sooner than later. Yes, ma'am. I, I will uh, I will have that for you as an agenda item in December with uh, looking at some different options that you might have to, to uh, help with that process. Okay. And we will move now uh, to agenda item number six, which is the discussion of and take action on proceedings for revocation, suspension, and other disciplinary actions. And we have with us today uh, Mr. Raymond Winter from the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you, sir, for being here with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Good morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> Raymond Winter with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, the first agenda items in the disciplinary area for you are default suspension orders. Each of these officers failed to respond to the Executive Director's notice of the institution of disciplinary proceedings. And consequently, all of these individuals are subject to uh, the imposition of a commission order suspending their peace officer and or jailer licenses. Uh, I'll list the individuals and I think then you can uh, take them up in mass uh, with your action. They are Trevor A. Berenger, Joe Cabezuela, Dean H. Gill, Sing Song Com. Intharaf, apologies for my pronunciation, Michael J. Powell, Vincent E. Rush, Byron Searcy, Harold W. Thomaston, and Joshua Ward. Uh, and given their failure to respond to the executive director's notice of enforcement proceedings, the executive director requests that the commission enter default orders suspending these individuals' licenses. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Hester. Uh, I move that the commission accept and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a default final order to suspend the license of Trevor Berenger through Joshua Ward listed in our packet. Okay. Do we have a second? Seconded. We have a motion and a second. I would ask those of you in favor to please raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. I just need Commissioner Griffiths. Commissioner I, uh, Griffiths. I spoke with him. I'm sorry. Uh, Chief, I spoke with him on the phone uh, just a moment ago. He is having technical difficulties. He can't hear us and, and is monitoring. Uh, he just cannot seem to get back to us. He did vote, by the way, Lori, uh, he voted yes on the Class A. I told him that he has my direct line. If anything comes up that he has uh, a, a comment that he wants to make, that he will call me directly and I'll make sure that we, we make that work one way or another. But right. he is having trouble getting back to us. So. Um, as as uh, Mr. Beecham said, uh, if he's a deciding vote, we'll make sure that we we get that. If it's if it's not needed, then we don't need to keep bothering him with phone calls. But he uh, he is hearing us, and he's he will let us know if there's anything that's pressing. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion passes. We'll go back to you, Mr. Winter. Commissioners, the next two individuals. Uh, Listed here are subject to cancellation proceedings. From time to time, the executive director discovers that a license has been issued to an individual who uh, was not qualified under the law to hold that license in the first place. Uh, here we have Robert L. Allen and Jose R. Monroy, a jailer and peace officer respectively, who subsequent to the issuance of their uh, licenses, the executive director staff discovered that they were not in fact qualified under the law to hold those licenses. Executive Director notified these individuals of their opportunity to contest cancellation proceedings. They have failed to respond to that notice and consequently are subject to default orders canceling their jailer and peace officer licenses respectively. And the Executive Director recommends that uh, the Commission issue these orders canceling the jailer license of Robert L. Allen 
and the peace officer license of Jose R. Monroy. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions or comments from the commissioners? Do we have a motion? Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Hester. I make a motion that the commission accept and, and adopt the recommendations of the executive director to enter a final default cancellation order for Robert L. Allen and Jose R. Monroy. Second it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, if you will please raise your hand. I've got them all except for Commissioner Griffiths. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winter? <clears throat> The commissioners, the next items are uh, matters that did go to contested case hearing uh, with the State Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, there are three listed, but we're only going to, it's my understanding, only going to consider two today. And those are the matters of Taiwan J. Jones and Patrick W. Tudor. Uh, I'd like to take them up individually uh, if that is okay with the commission. In the matter of Taiwan Jones, Mr. Jones, uh, uh, received a deferred adjudication uh, for a criminal offense that involved family violence. Consequently, the executive director brought disciplinary proceedings to revoke his jailer license uh, because the victim in the underlying assault was a family member as defined in the family code. The executive director moved for summary disposition in this matter while it's been pending before the State Office of Administrative Hearings. And the administrative law judge has issued a proposal for decision granting our motion for summary disposition and recommending that Mr. Jones's jailer license be revoked. Uh, Mr. Jones did not file a response to our motion for summary disposition. Uh, at this time, the executive director recommends that the commission enter an order approving the proposal for decision from the State Office of Administrative Hearings and issue an order revoking Taiwan Jones jailer license. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have about this case. Any questions for Mr. Winter? Okay, do we have a motion? Commissioner Hester. I'm sure I'll make a uh, motion to accept accept the proposal for decision and revoke the license of Taiwan Jones. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, Mr. Winter. The commissioners, uh, the next item on your agenda is uh, in the matter of Patrick W. Tudor. Uh, this was an action brought by the executive director to revoke the peace officer license of Mr. Tudor. I see that Mr. Snyder, uh, Mr. Tudor's counsel, who represented him in the SOA proceedings, uh, has uh, taking off his mic off mute and is now appearing uh as is mr savage mr savage is with our office the office of the attorney general and represented the executive director in the proceedings of soa uh, there is a proposal for decision uh before you after the SOA proceeding where the SOA administrative law judge has uh recommended uh that the relief sought by the executive director should be granted and that is the commission should enter an order revoking Mr. Tudor's peace officer license. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Mr. Snyder wishes to address the commission uh, and uh, Mr. Savage is also available if the commission should have any questions about. Uh, his. Uh, gentlemen, uh, before we uh, have you speak, Mr. Beecham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure and I, uh, for the interruption in the 
proceeding. I want to ensure, Lori, that we uh, noted that the motion passed. I don't think it was on the last action item. I don't think it was ever orally stated, but I want to make sure for the record that we have that that motion we passed. I know we took a hand count, but I want to ensure that that's in the record. Thank you. I will. Uh, I will catch that next time. So thank you, Mr. Snyder. Yes. Thank you all for being here today. Um, please, sir. We are uh, here to listen to your comments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me some time to speak on this. I think it's a very important uh, matter for you to consider. Uh, I wanted to discuss uh, the the uh, proposal for a revocation of uh, Patrick Tudor's license. Patrick is here with me. Uh, I wanted to give um, some of the background uh, and mitigating circumstances here that I would like uh, for the commission to consider. Um, Patrick uh, is a veteran of the U.S. Army. He served in Iraq um, prior to becoming a police officer. He started with the Garland Police Department in 2005 uh, as a police officer. The incident uh, that's the genesis of why we're here today happened on August 31st, 2012, about a little over eight years ago. Uh, Patrick was on patrol when he uh, recognized a, a wanted vehicle and began to try to do a traffic stop on that vehicle. A high-speed chase ensued. Uh, the chase was joined by multiple officers from multiple different agencies, including the DPS helicopter, uh, joined in this pursuit. At the end of the pursuit, uh, the uh, Patrick discharged his firearm at the driver of that, uh, that vehicle he was pursuing. Um, this happened in a, in a residential area where the uh, suspect had fled to and, and drove driven up into uh, the front yards of, of some houses in this era uh, in the city of Mesquite. Uh, he fired 41 rounds and there's been a, uh, a lot of talk about that, but I wanted to point out that uh, the majority of these rounds never penetrated the, the pickup that was being driven by the suspect. The suspect was hit three times. Uh, there was uh, at least one round that we know of that did uh, strike a one of the residences in the cul-de-sac. So <clears throat> after the uh, this incident, the Mesquite Police Department conducted their criminal investigation. The Garland Police Department conducted their administrative investigation. And uh, ultimately, um, Patrick was indicted for manslaughter in Dallas County. Uh, he was also uh, indefinitely suspended by Garland and he appealed that suspension. Uh, the case went to trial uh, in December of 2016. Uh, the lead detective for the Mesquite Police Department testified that Patrick's actions were reasonable under a Graham v. Connor analysis. We also had the sheriff of um, Bastrop County, Texas, a retired Texas Ranger, testified at trial, and he testified under Graham v. Connor that Patrick's uh, actions were reasonable as well. There was a uh, hung jury, nine of the jurors voting to acquit. Uh, so there was a hung jur jury, mistrial was declared. A, a second trial was scheduled for October the 17th. This was a retrial. Patrick uh, was offered a plea bargain deal and he accepted it. He pled no contest to discharging a firearm in a municipality, a class A misdemeanor. And for that, he agreed to nine months of deferred adjudication, unsupervised probation, which he completed successfully. <clears throat> During this time, there was also a civil lawsuit that was brought by the, the family of the, uh, the suspect who was killed. That lawsuit was uh, uh, brought under uh, federal statutes 1983. The federal judge uh, dismissed that, um, uh, granting uh, the a motion for summary judgment uh, and determining that Patrick was entitled to qualified immunity. So that's the, the, the civil case was resolved 
by it was dismissed with prejudice. The criminal case was resolved by a plea of no contest to a class A misdemeanor. As far as the administrative case, uh, once those were done, Garland reinstated Patrick. They withdrew all of the administrative charges. He resigned from the police department. Uh, he was given a general uh, discharge, F5, which he then appealed. He went to a, a hearing before SOA, and the SOA judge ordered that his F5 be amended to an honorable discharge. So those are the facts behind here. And what uh, the executive director has done is he's asked for a revocation based off of two things, based off of the incident from August of 2012, and he's asked for a revocation because during this time that Patrick was, uh, from, the, from the date of the incident, August 31st, he was first put on administrative leave. Um, and then he was indefinitely suspended February of 2013. During that time, T. Cole issued some reprimands because he wasn't keeping up with his training. Uh, Garland wasn't providing any training to him because he, he had, wasn't working as a police officer during this time. He tried to keep up with his training, but they, they issued reprimands on three occasions to him. The first one was issued <clears throat> January 16th, 2015. And that is the only reprimand that the training cycle that involved a portion of that was during a time when he was actually working as a Garland police officer. But uh, a good portion of that time also was after he was indefinitely suspended, no longer working as a police officer. So he issued that uh, January 16th reprimand in uh, 2015. And then another one was issued the January the 4th of 2016. Before I get to the third one, I want to address what I've argued is and the statute that T. Cole seeks to use for revocation on here for, for this didn't even exist at the issuance of these two reprimands, was never mentioned in these first two reprimands because the statute that existed at that time uh, was 20, uh, that, that would have addressed this was, would have been rule 223.15, which says that uh, the commission could suspend an officer for these repeated reprimands for failing uh, to complete training. Now, the statute that T. Cole is, is wanting to use here wasn't effective until February the 1st of 2016. And that statute simply says that uh, on the third occasion of non-compliance that T. Cole shall revoke uh, a, a peace officer license. So his third reprimand happened May the 15th of 2018. And what I've argued is <clears throat> that these first two reprimands that never mentioned the possibility of a revocation that happened before the statute that they're now wanting to use to take his license even existed should not be applied retroactively to, to Patrick Tudor. Um, the statute itself, even the wording of it, to me, uh, the wording in uh, 220.19 doesn't specifically talk about a reprimand. It simply says noncompliance. There's no mention of the word reprimand in that statute. The, the, the more applicable statute would be 223.15 that talks about reprimands uh, for failing to complete your training. And so I've asked and I've argued that he should not have a revocation based off of his failure to complete training for those reasons having to do with when the statute was effective. The, and not only that, the, the overall circumstances that are involved here where he, he's never actually worked as a police officer since he was indefinitely suspended um, or actually really since the incident because as Garland and most agencies do, they put him on administrative leave uh, immediately after the incident. And in this case, he never came back to full duty uh, until indefinitely suspended him. So those are such mitigating circumstances.
circumstances that I believe that it's unfair to take his license based off of these uh, these reprimands for not completing his training because he was doing the best he could. He was someone that didn't have the resources of a department's training, and I'm not and I'm not blaming Garland. I don't know of any department that's ever trained for an individual who's currently indefinitely suspended. But the fact remains, he didn't have those resources to do this. Uh, so I think that it would be unfair to take his license based off of the the three reprimands that T. Cole has, has mentioned. I also think that the circumstances of the incident itself, when you consider um, that he's, you know, he pled no contest to discharging a firearm. Uh, yes, that involves recklessness, uh, that statute itself. But when you look at the, the, the facts that he's never been He's been, not only has he not been charged with manslaughter uh, or not been convicted of manslaughter, he was charged of it, but he was first had a mistrial. Then the state offered him the, this deal for a misdemeanor, which he took. He's completed all that. This was something that he did in the line of duty that multiple people have testified, been on record saying under Graham v. Connor that he acted reasonably. The Garland Police Department withdrew their charges so what we're looking at is uh, an individual with a history of service, uh, not only to the city of Garland, the state of Texas as a peace officer, but to, to our country uh, under the rules that would be in play. I, I think what he's looking at is a suspension or a class A misdemeanor of between uh, no less than 120 days and no more than 10 years. We're already 10 years or eight years since the incident. So we're asking for the commission to consider these mitigating circumstances. We're asking for the commission to not revoke his license and instead issue some sort of a suspension um, of no more than 10 years or less than 120 days. Thank you. Mr. Tudor. Um, I'm assuming that is who is to your right. Yes, ma'am. He's here with me. Yes, ma'am. Um, we'd like to hear from you, sir. Uh, thanks for letting us speak. Um, this event uh, is something that no officer wants to be involved in uh, using their weapon to uh, defend themselves. Uh, from day one, um, if you look at all the facts and evidence, um, Mesquite, uh, defended me and said I didn't do anything wrong. I was dealing with a violent suspect that was ramming my, my patrol car, dragging my squad car backwards. I discharged my weapon into the door and, and the, the training that I have from the military and, and uh, Garland Police Department um, were shooting hollow point bullets. Those are known to fragment uh, when they hit uh, hard items like metal. I knew that's what was happening, um, which uh, explains the 41 rounds that were put into the side of the door because um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best with a, uh, with a suspect that was found to be high on methamphetamine, um, was acting violently, had just uh, committed a, a, a felony. Um, and the, the not only criminally, uh, the criminal law that allows me to defend myself um, from a, a, a felon um, that's acting violently, but case law also says that I can discharge as many rounds as I believe to be necessary to stop the threat, and that's what we did. And we found uh, the evidence showed that 31 rounds were lodged in the suspect's door. And as police officers, um, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, we just do the best that we can. And uh, I, I did everything that I could to survive that night. So I appreciate you guys uh, considering this. And uh, uh, you know the, the facts when when you look at everything they just uh they they show that everybody testified on my behalf on the criminal side and i took this plea deal for my family um because i have two little girls at home and i didn't want to put them through another trial so thank you very much uh, mr beecham 
Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, before the Attorney General uh, Office gets an opportunity to reply, I just want to make sure and this obviously applies to whether it's the Attorney General's Office or Mr. Tudor as counsel. Any arguments or statements or assertions of fact that were not made at the SOA hearing or are in the record before you, which incorporates the SOA hearing, uh, please be advised that those are not for consideration, anything other than argument today. So it, it, bottom line is if things weren't factually established by evidence, whether testimony or documentary at the SOA hearing, then they can't be raised for the first time before you today. I just wanted to remind you all that and make a note of it. Thank you. Mr. Winter. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Robert Savage with the Texas Attorney General's Office, um, uh, appearing uh, with Mr. Winter today. Uh, the uh, packet before you obviously contains not, not one, but two independent bases of revocation uh, on which the uh, Administrative Law Judge agreed with the Executive Director's uh, petition and um, recommended uh, revocation on both grounds. The uh, uh, Mr. Snyder has highlighted some mitigating facts with respect to the offense itself, uh, but there were aggravating facts as well that the ALJ heard uh, that did factor into uh, her application of Section 223.19b and determining whether the offense directly related to Mr. Uh, Tudor's uh, duties and responsibilities as a peace officer for Garland Police Department. Among those facts were included the fact that there was a passenger inside the vehicle at which Mr. Snyder was firing his um, shots. Um, Mr. Snyder reloaded his firearm twice, and um, uh, specifically, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Snyder, as acknowledged by Mr. Snyder, fired his weapon 41 times uh, to the degree to which the ALJ uh, found as a specific finding of fact that Mr. Snyder's conduct was serious and extremely risky to the public. Lastly, um, Mr. Uh, Allen, the victim, uh, was not armed. Uh, he had no firearm. Uh, and while he was engaged in a high speed pursuit uh, with um, um, uh, Mr. Allen, had come to us or had reached a uh, point at which they were no longer uh, traveling at high speeds. They had reached a cul de sac uh, where the victim uh, was. Uh, didn't have any any means uh, to escape. Um, there are additional items that were cited as um, <clears throat> they were cited as uh, mitigating facts, but I would point out, as Mr. Beecham just uh, acknowledged, a couple of those facts are not in the record. Uh, specifically, the uh, I believe the testimony of the detective at the criminal trial regarding uh, who opined on Mr. Tudor's uh, conduct. I uh, don't believe that was included within uh, the uh, record that the AOJ considered, uh, nor um, uh, did the context of any rulings in a civil case that uh, may have uh, come out of uh, the uh, incident, uh, as well as uh, any um, facts pertaining to um, an F5 decision uh, regarding Mr. Tudor's separation or designation of discharge from the Garland Police Department. <clears throat> After the ALJ considered uh, the facts, uh, the admissions of uh, Mr. Tudor, uh, the testimony of um, Captain Stolot, as well as uh, uh, the exhibits that the executive director had put together, the uh, ALJ agreed with the recommendation or the request to um, apply 223.19b and uh, revoke Mr. Tudor's license on that independent basis. Turning over to the second independent basis of revocation, uh, following the um, following the incident uh, involving Mr. Allen's death, uh, Mr. Tudor uh, failed to remain compliant on three instances with his continuing education obligations to the commission. Um, in each of those instances, um, he. Uh, was a fully licensed uh, peace officer with the obligation to complete his 
uh, training I as did. is peace officer under commission rules. Nobody wanted to work. So I still got a chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the opposite had a TICO commission meeting virtual video. Oh. Mr. Mr. Snyder, I'm going to thank you for muting, or can you uh, can you mute your mic, please? Uh, we're getting some feedback, and I think it's because we have uh, maybe more than one mic unmuted. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. I would ask, I would ask Madam Chair, that uh, staff mute whatever that caller is, whoever the... Uh, either Dennis or Lita mute that other line. If I may. Uh, all right, I'll write you later. Dennis, can you, uh, we seem to have another call that's bleeding over or another person called um, or meeting that's bleeding over into ours. Can, uh, uh, can I, you I believe it is stopped. I can't tell. I did mute uh, three or four mics in the hopes that that would stop it. Okay. Well, I think that that seemed to have worked. So. We'll try one more time, sir. Thank you for your for your patience as we uh, as we work through that. It's all I guess it's all new to all of us. Uh, so thank you. Um, so turning over to the second independent basis of revocation, uh, uh, as uh, pointed out by uh, counsel for Mr. Tudor, uh, Tudor failed to comply with his obligation to obtain peace officer continuing uh, education. Uh, by uh, failing to be compliant on three occasions, including August 31st, 2013, August 31st, 2015, and September 30th of 2017. <clears throat> uh, with respect to each of those uh, instances, he was non-compliant with his training obligations at the conclusion of the training period uh, within which the uh, peace officers required to complete their training. Uh, Mr. Snyder has, uh, or excuse me, Mr. Tudor has uh, pointed out to counsel that the uh, uh, rule that uh, was invoked in this case was passed in February 1st, 2016, after the first two instances of noncompliance. Therefore, uh, uh, at the risk of mischaracterizing anything uh, in his argument, uh, it's uh, their view that this is a retroactive application of the rule and therefore inappropriate. Um, the PFD before the commission uh, in your packet uh, would include uh, that actual PFD where uh, initially the ALJ looked at that very issue and asked for arguments from uh, the uh, executive director as well as uh, from Mr. Tudor. Uh, initially, the ALJ uh, found that it was an improper retroactive application. However, uh, following the filing of an exception, by the executive director requesting or, or bringing to attention the ALJ's uh, uh, case law that applies to uh, that very issue, uh, the ALJ reversed and uh, changed her PFD with respect to that finding and ultimately found that there was a uh, valid basis to recommend revocation as well. Um, and to summarize the reason, effectively, uh, the third instance of noncompliance occurred on February the uh, excuse me, on September 30th, 2017, which was more than a year and a half after the date that the rule had been implemented. Uh, therefore, the actual uh, uh, conduct giving rise to revocation occurred after the rule was created. And um, under existing uh, case law and uh, interpretation of uh, commission rules, the uh, antecedent conduct where the previous acts of a licensee may be considered uh, as part of a determination to see whether they were in non-compliance on the date that they received their third instance uh, or their, their third instance of uh, continuing education violation. Uh, effectively, uh, most of these arguments were heard by the administrative law judge uh, with respect to both the continuing education violations as well as to the offense violations. 
and um, having considered those arguments, the administrative law judge agreed with uh, the request uh, to recommend revocation on both grounds. Um, and uh, the only other thing I would point out in conclusion is that with respect to the retroactivity provision, uh, Mr. Tudor did not file a uh, exception uh, to the uh, proposal for decisions uh, that were issued by the administrative law judge. And thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Hester. Madam Chair, I, I, I had a question, but I think Council, uh, Mr. Snyder, uh, I, I don't know what's appropriate. So, uh, Mr. Beecham, if, if this is an opportunity for him to say something, or, or do we go into the questions that we have as commissioners? I think if you're ready for questions, now would be a good time. Both. Uh, both petitioner and respondents uh, representatives had an opportunity to present. So uh, as soon as Mr. Snyder returns, certainly any questions you may have for him, that would be the appropriate time. Okay. Um, if you have any questions for, I'm sorry, uh, if we have any questions for the AG's office, we can also should wait till Mr. Snyder gets back as well. Okay, go ahead. Um, Commissioner Hester. Again, my own question is, in, in a, in a, what, what was the date of completion of the community service, or community supervision for the for the uh, the Class A? Uh, yes, sir. That would have been uh, it was nine months after he. I'll have that in a second here. <clears throat> uh. I believe it would have been July 2018. Thank you, right? Thank you. Yeah, I was looking for the date. So yeah, he took the uh, he took the plea October 2017th. So that would have put it around July of 2018 uh, when he completed uh, the term. Okay. And okay, that that just gives me the time frame for for the. Uh, the class A misdemeanor uh, replication. So I, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. If I could also mention um, that uh, the statements I made about the mesquite detective um, and the civil case, I can say the mesquite detective statements that that's contained in an affidavit that was submitted along with my response to a motion for summary disposition. I, I, I think Mr. Savage uh, may have not recall that, but it's it, the the affidavit was attached to that response. Um, that affidavit was then submitted as an exhibit at the at the SOA hearing before the judge. It was T. Cole's exhibit. I think it was number thirteen exhibit. So that that fact is out there. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I, I my memory serves me. I believe I've also submitted documentation regarding the civil case, which I if I remember correctly, I think Mr. Savage had had brought that up. So I wanted to uh, remind him of, of those things being brought up, submitted in documents um, to SOA. Thank you. Mr. Savage, any further comments? Uh, I would defer to uh, whatever's included in the packet uh, and the record itself. Um, I certainly could could have made a mistake, but I um, uh, I would I would prefer to let the record speak for itself in case I've erred. Uh, but I don't have anything further. Thank you. Do any other commissioners have any comments or questions? Commissioner Burris. Um, I, I don't have any questions. I'll just make a comment that while there were a couple of different basis for bringing forward um, this decision to us, uh, I, I'm not interested in relitigating whatever 
happened in um, in the the shooting and, and the case, the manslaughter case, and how that ended up getting um, resolved. Uh, for me, the second basis based on rule uh, is sufficient uh, enough for me to make a decision. We, as, as license holders, you know, I, I am not one of the um, peace officers on this commission, but I do hold a license as well by the state of Texas, and I'm required to maintain um, all the requirements in this state and the other state in which I have uh, my license. So, you know, even though I'm not practicing law in the state of New Mexico with great regularity, um, and I go long stretches without, I still have to maintain um, continuing education hours and paying dues and everything else, whether I decide to exercise um, my rights with that license or not. So it, it's um, a weak argument to me to say, well, Garland PD you know, didn't pay for it for me or, or let me off to be able to do this. And there are plenty of agencies around the state of Texas that do not offer um, uh, funds for, for their uh, law enforcement officers to get those hours. You know, what they do offer a lot of times is just some time off of work to be able to do that. Um, it's a responsibility that uh, the licensee has. It is up to him to, uh, to follow up on that, make sure all that's complete, um, as well as notifying the agency of a change of address uh, to receive information. Um, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Savage, Mr. Winters, and I all have to do that as attorneys. Um, all of our peace officers out there have to do that as well. Um, so it is um, unfortunate that we had to come to, uh, to this today, but um, there have been many opportunities along the way uh, for Mr. Tudor to um, to change his behavior, and um, and it's really unfortunate. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Um, any other questions, uh, Commissioner Hood? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to hear from Mr. Tudor. I, I don't want to hear any more of the the incident on the uh, the shooting. But you've had three opportunities to uh, to get your to be in compliance with your training. Uh, I know there's a lot going on through those 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 years, but you did have opportunity. Is that correct? I did the best that I could under uh, threat of jail and trying to work and you know uh, the the insanity that was. Uh, being charged as an officer, um, and uh, so I, I completed the training that uh, once I received notice, I didn't realize that I was in violation. I was having to learn all these things as I went because uh, as a at Garland is really good with, with uh, keeping up with the training for us, so I learned the rules as I went, and uh, as soon as I received notice, I got online, I paid for the training, and I did the best that I could as, as, whenever I got those notices. And I, I came into compliance as soon as I was told, hey, you're missing some hours. And there was, I believe there was one where I was just missing a couple hours. I didn't realize that, that I was just a few hours short. So I, I was doing the best that I could under the circumstances. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Sheriff Griffiths, if I might make a comment. Uh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, each and every one of us that carry a peace officer's license, uh, it is our own responsibility to keep up with those hours. Uh, we have about 300 licensees within my agency. Uh, many of my uh, people get online and, and keep up with their hours. We do have a training lieutenant who tries to keep up with that stuff, but it is each and every one's own responsibility to keep up with those requirements. Um, uh, we, we, we've been hit with this stuff this year, but uh, all the conferences closed down, but uh, uh, 
uh, I stress that to my people, that they have to check themselves. It is their responsibility to make sure they get their own education requirements. And that's all I've got at this time. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Snyder, I'm going to ask you to mute your mic again, sir. We're getting some feedback. Thank you. I don't see anyone's hand up. Do we have a motion? Commissioner Hester. I'm sure I make a motion to accept the proposal for decision uh, to revoke the license of Patrick Tudor. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor, if you will please raise your hand. I for Sheriff Griffiths. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. So, um, gentlemen, I appreciate you taking the time to be here today and and to share your thoughts. Um, I'm sorry it didn't go in your favor, um, uh, and I'm sure it's not. Uh, what you had hoped for, uh, but we do wish you the the very best of luck as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think we are back to Mr. Winter. <clears throat> yes, commissioners. The remaining items on your agenda are informational only. No further action is required. The next three individuals uh, are licensees who engaged in uh, criminal misconduct that gives rise to summary statutory revocations. Uh, they received convictions for felony offenses and by operation of law, their peace officer and or jailer licenses are summarily revoked uh, upon the final conviction for the felony offense. And they are listed here for your information. Uh, there are also some statutory suspensions listed uh, for your information. Those individuals receive deferred adjudication for felony offenses, which subject them to the imposition of summary statutory suspensions uh, without further action being required by the commission. Also listed are the names of individuals who have reached uh, agreements with prosecuting authorities and or with the executive director uh, in exchange for the uh, the resolution of criminal proceedings and or administrative proceedings for the permanent surrender of their license. Uh, and these have all been accepted by the executive director and are listed for your uh, information. Finally, there are categories of suspensions for individuals who failed to uh, comply with legislative continuing education requirements, as well as reprimands that were issued by the executive director two officers who failed to uh, comply with aspects of their continuing education obligation. And all of these are listed for your information only. Again, no further action is required. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have about any of those items. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Well, Mr. Winter and Mr. Savage, thank you so much for your work and for uh, being here today. We appreciate you both. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And it is my understanding that we do not have anyone that has signed up um, to speak in regards to uh, a Agenda item, ah, agenda item number seven, receiving public comment. So, um, Kim, is have you received information other than that? That was the last information that I had received. No, ma'am, not the of which I'm aware. Okay. Um, Commissioner Whitaker. Yes, ma'am. 
you know, the one advantage to this format versus uh, in person and sitting at the table and, and having to uh, to try to see people uh, down the line. Uh, it is nice to be able to, I guess, and I guess I can say look at you face to face, although uh, uh, that's taken on new meaning. Um, I would like to recognize Houston PD and uh, I worked with the T. Cole staff um, and executive director Vickers uh, over the last week or so to confirm this. But I want to recognize Houston PD. You uh, essentially had no officers that were reprimanded or suspended, suspended as a result of failing to complete the legislatively mandated continuing education. Uh, Houston is the largest uh, agency in the state of Texas with the most number of people and with the size of your agency and the number of employees that you have. I think that this is a significant accomplishment and I think that your in-service uh, training staff certainly deserves recognition because uh, this required a lot of management and a lot of work and I just I think it's a superb job well done and if you would pass on our congratulations uh, I'd be appreciative. Well, thank you very much. I do know that our some of our T. Cole staff is watching this morning. And uh, thank you to T. Cole as well, because I know they've received some phone calls, as well as uh, Commissioner Hester on some of the things that DPS is doing over there. And of course, COVID has taken us into a place that we never thought we would be. And when you have 5,000 people that you're trying to get to an academy class, uh, it's a little difficult. But thank you very, very much. Well, certainly uh, deserves some recognition and, and thank you because that's, that also saves time um, and effort on the part of the TCOL staff to not have to, to manage that. So um, uh, quite a win for everyone. So well done, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for the staff or commissioners, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me go, let me go to Ms. Jackson. Um, you've been working hard on uh, potential 2021 commission dates. And um, if you could provide us with those, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. For uh, 2021, the commission dates will be, commission meeting dates will be March the 4th, June the 3rd, September 2nd, and December 2nd. And we'd like to thank you for your work. I know you've been working with the hotel. Uh, you've been working with uh, the University of Texas at Austin. And we do want to recognize them. They've agreed to sponsor us again uh, in 2021, which gives us some reduced rates on the, on the facility. So uh, thank you for all of your work uh, getting those dates uh, set. So you're welcome. Um, so thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, or questions from uh, the commissioners or any of the TCOL staff? Well, again, I would like to, to thank um, everyone who uh, is here today uh, from the TCOL staff to my fellow commissioners, as well as all of you that have joined us today. Thank you for your patience uh, and flexibility as we work through a couple of uh, technical issues. Um, we very, very much appreciate it. Uh, I've already uh, fielded a few questions uh, about the December meeting, and I think what we've all learned from COVID is that uh, it's a day-by-day -day and week-by-week uh, -week journey, and uh, we will make a, a decision on whether the December meeting is in person or uh, uh, via this format. Uh, as soon as we can or as soon as we are reasonably uh, have a reasonable assumption that we could make that decision with everyone's safety in mind. So uh, we will get that information out as, as soon as we can. Uh, I would ask that everyone uh, continue to, to stay safe um, and thank you again for being here today. And I will officially, um, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake here. Uh, I need to go to agenda item number 
um, 8, uh, we will not be going into executive session today, uh, which means that we will not be returning from executive session today, which is agenda item number 9. And I need to call for a motion to adjourn. We have one for a uh, motion from Commissioner Whitaker. Seconded. And Commissioner Burris. And uh, the motion passes, which means we are officially adjourned. Thank you, commissioners.